welcome to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And today we're getting on the gram with Lauren Bath, who is one of Australia's first professional Instagrammers. She was actually enlisted by massive tourism companies and governments worldwide. She boasts over half a million followers on Instagram and has been featured in travel and leisure magazine, Mashable, Daily News, and all over the world through her incredible content on her Instagram profile. So for those of you who want to learn more about Instagram, more about getting rich, more about getting more clients and building your brand, this is going to be one you are going to want to listen to. Let's get all Grammy with Lauren Bar. Listen up. Thank you so much for having me. No, it's a real pleasure. Now, listen, I uh, f- I have to say you have quite the story uh, and I'm not going to try and tell it for you because every every artist should tell their own story. But for those people who don't know who you are, like uh, who is Lauren Bath? Uh, well, my claim to fame is that I was Australia's first professional Instagrammer. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> That's a big claim. It's, uh, it's a claim, actually. Uh, the media gave me that name. So and a professional Instagrammer? Professional Instagrammer. Yeah, right. Um, people wonder, does that mean I work for Instagram? Yeah. Uh, no, not at all. I I was an early adopter of Instagram. and So when you say early adopter, how early? Are we talking first week, first month? No, first year. First year, right. Yeah, so, so what been, year was that? Uh, 2010 they started Instagram and I was on board in August 2011. <coughs> yeah, right. Yeah, so pretty early. <laughs> uh, I effectively managed to quit my job in a career that I didn't love anymore. I used to be a chef and become a... You don't a, love food? I do love food. You do love food? <laughs> Just not like cooking it for other people? I don't like cooking... Yeah, I don't like cooking for a boss. Yeah, right. I would never say never about going back to to having a cafe or having something of yep. my own. I still love food, but I would never go back to working as a commercial chef. <laughs> and you, so you went from food to photography. So I went from food to photography. I um, I picked up Instagram just as a bit of a hobby, and I didn't know it was about photography. Crazy. Uh, I took. I think the first photo I posted was a selfie of my boyfriend that he took. Totally missing the point of the platform. <laughs> um, but I, I thought I being a foodie, well, the first photo you would have taken would have been of your, of your food, but no, it's actually the boyfriend. Everybody asked me that. Yeah. But I, I really didn't like taking pictures of my food back then because Instagram and photography was a creative outlet from cooking. Right. So it was anything but food. Okay, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it was it was a hobby. I learned quite quickly that the platform was about sharing my own images. Yeah. I started getting a little bit creative uh, with an iPhone and kind of fell in love with the process of taking pictures and sharing them. It was it very much went hand in hand. Uh, I decided to upgrade my camera not for Instagram, right. uh, but because I was going to Zimbabwe, my partner is Zimbabwean, and I wanted to take better pictures than what my mobile phone could take. Yeah, right. Uh, and that's why I got my first camera. And it's just, it's been crazy since then. Like I, I fell in love with photography. Uh, I was very early on Instagram. So I was there in the boom time, grew a massive audience, uh, around 200,000 followers in 18 months. That's pretty darn good. <laughs> so around And that's the time, off the back of photography. Yeah. No pretty, food? No, no food at yeah, all. Yeah, right. Um, but there weren't was many- Was this before taking photos of your food was cool? Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know. I think taking photos of your food has always been a little cool. It's like wearing Crocs. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, I, I didn't resort to that. <laughs> Timmy's got Crocs. You've got Crocs. How many Timmy? I can tell by that face. Look, yeah. <laughs> he does. You yeah, can tell. You can tell. <laughs> um, yeah, so I- I did decide to quit my job because I I thought there was an opportunity to do something with that 200,000 followers. Uh, I was getting a few opportunities just off email, mainly from American brands, Um, but a couple of Australian tourism boards had approached me and I just thought there's something there. And I was definitely at the point where my boss was saying like, no, you can't have more days off work. Like, are you kidding? You're a chef. Chefs don't take days off work. So So were you a head chef? No, I wasn't actually. I have been in the past, but uh, this time around I was working in a cafe. Uh, It was kind of only ever meant to be a temporary job. I wanted to travel prior to that. (laughs) Um, And I met my partner and that kind of stopped me um, in my tracks. So I did keep this job that I thought would only be a short term thing. And yeah, it was- And it got in the way. It kind of got in the way. Yeah. It was like, I. the best definition is my job was in the way of my Instagramming. I literally, <laughs> you took the words right out of yeah. my mouth. It's like yeah. having to go to work. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm Instagramming right now. I have to go to work. This, is, <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> okay. That's kind of cool. And so how did you, how were you able to monetize Instagram? Because you, I'm going to assume you weren't a professional photographer before Instagram. No. Did you have an interest in photography before Instagram? I got 
my interest for photography through Instagram. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so at, at what point did you were, you were you able to, or more importantly, how were you able to make money through becoming a professional Instagrammer to be able to quit your job and tell your boss to go and shove his chicken breast? <laughs> I didn't tell him that. We're still okay. friends. You're still friends? Right. Oh, awkward. <laughs> um, my old head <clears throat> chef and I are best friends, actually. Okay, nice. Um, oh, yeah. Like, it was, it was pretty crazy. I... Oh, sorry, I forgot the question. That's all right. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> what was it, Timmy? No, it was how did you how did you go from monetizing I from being I a chef? It? Yeah, because so, oh, everyone wants to make their hobby their yes. you know, their pursuit. But I, I'm going to say this is in the early days. So this is going to be like 2012, 2013. 2013. At this point? 2013. It was, two, it was actually so it was New Year's Eve on 2012. No kidding. When I made the decision. Wow. Uh, I we had a kitchen hand not come to work and I was washing dishes oh, uh, on, on New, New Year's, Year's Eve, Eve. <laughs> in my thirties. <30s>. <laughs> Uh, thinking, wow, like, is this, wow, this is my life. Yeah, Bridget Diary <laughs> playing in the background. Yeah. yeah. So I, I did make the decision that night. I talked to my boss, not on the first because I had a hangover, yeah. <laughs> but on the second after I'd thought it through a little bit more and talked to my family and my and partner. made sure it wasn't like a drunken decision. Yeah, yeah like tell me this isn't crazy. Uh, and I did sit down with my boss on the 2nd of January 2013 and I said to him that I, yeah, I wanted to give my notice and I wanted to see what Instagram could do for me, which was pretty crazy. Crazy. Was his first response, what's Instagram? No, he knew because okay, he I was knew. always busted in the kitchen on my phone on Instagram. Yep, okay. Everybody knew it was pretty pretty obvious what was going on. Uh, he was surprised and he kind of offered me some part-time work. Were and you making money from Instagram no. at this point? So this was the funny thing. Yeah. I think because of my age and because of my career, for me, there was always a very clear distinction between working and not working. And when you work, you get paid. Yep. So in creative industries, I think a big problem that people have is, is struggling to get paid. You mm. know, what am I worth and how do I ask people and there's this whole like, you know, shoot this wedding and we'll give you great exposure and you'll get more weddings. Yeah. And it's, you know, for me, it was black and white. Like this was my job. I wanted this to be a job. I didn't know what it looked like at that point, but I knew I needed to get paid. Okay. So the few opportunities that I was starting to get uh, from Australian tourism, I first of all said, you have to pay me. And the, the people I was talking to were saying how much and what will you give us for that? And I was literally saying, I don't know. And I think it was a combination of just my honesty and my, my naivety. And they kind of, I don't know, I think I was a breath of fresh air in media and they kind of just worked with me. So it was almost like, well, how much? Well, I'm not sure. You go first. No, yeah, you go first. Yeah, no, you go first. Pretty much. Yeah, and, right. and then it became a thousand dollars flat rate. Didn't photo. matter. No, for the job. Right, just for <laughs> the job. Whatever the job was, <laughs> that was what I charged. Yeah, right. <laughs> because that was actually more than I was earning as a chef for a whole week. Okay. And I knew I wouldn't get that many jobs. And some of these jobs were trips. So I would go away for three or four or even up to a week, uh, seven days. So I was thinking, well, $1,000, you know, if I get that most weeks, I'm making about what I was making and I can survive as a human. Yeah. And uh, so that was my starting point. And within six months, I was making about what I made as a chef consistently. Yeah. And within a year, I was exceeding that. Well done. <laughs> like, first of all, congratulations on having the balls to make a decision like that. Because most people will wait until they build up a bit of bank or they'll build up a bit of side revenue before they take that before they take that leap. But you were just like, what was it? What was what was what was it that gave you that faith that when you're in that moment on the third of January that you sat down with your boss, you looked him in the eye, and he said, uh, you know, no soup for you. Like, what what was what drove that? It was a gut feeling. Yeah, right. Yeah. Are you an intuitive person? No, not at all. Really, I'm becoming more intuitive now. Okay, and I think when I I was younger, I was quite intuitive and I lost it yep. over the years. You lost know, it I, or tuned out? Maybe I tuned out. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I, um, I was in a long-term relationship with a previous partner. He wasn't overly ambitious. I got stuck in the rat race. You know, I was working, saving money, going on one trip a year, you know, buying a whole bunch of shit that I didn't need. Just to impress people regular, you didn't know. Yeah, like just regular stuff. And I, I had this gut feeling and I can't describe it other than that I knew, you know, I knew I had to give it a go and I was terrified. Um, I've worked since I was 14. I've always had a steady job. I've always been the responsible one. I never do anything crazy. And I just, I just knew that I had to give it a go as scary as it was. That's so fantastic. That, that strong, like punch in the gut. And so that was 2013. Yes. So I'm going to assume this is June, July, 2013. You're starting to make money. You're starting to make good bank off this. Mm -hmm. What's happened since then? 
Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I've gone from a small business to a company. I've started offering more services. Uh, they've all been intuitive. I've never chased money. Like I've yeah. never, I've never decided to do something based on money. What is it that you, is your decision making criteria? If you're going to do something, how do you decide? So when I quit my job, uh, mm-hmm. when I was that was like first of January, that day where I was deciding, I wrote down three things, and it was that classic, you know, if you didn't have to work, what would you be doing with your life? And I wrote down photography, travel, and social media. Yeah, right. So every decision pretty much that I make in my business leads me to create a life for myself that allows me to to travel as much as I want, uh, take photos as much as I want and, you know, just be free to be myself on social media and, and have platforms where I have a voice. Yeah, right. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And so now that's what you do. You travel, yeah. you take photos and you do social media. Pretty much. Like um, there's there's lots of aspects to my business now, but in some way they all make me happy and they all lead back to those goals. Yep. Uh, for example, I do campaign management and that came down to, you know, in the early days, a so client. So this is paid traffic management like on, on Instagram or paid uh, campaign? No, so, or? so a campaign where a tourism board would right. want to run a campaign gotcha. and they want to bring in. Because you've worked in. with some pretty heavy hitters. When I yeah. say heavy hitters, you've worked with, let me see if I've got this straight. You've worked with uh, oof, Australian tourism, Switzerland tourism, South African tourism, New Zealand tourism, Canadian tourism, <laughs> Finland tourism, Dubai tourism, New York, the Plaza New York, Travel Direct. Olympus, like intrepid, like you've worked with a lot of people in the in the tourism industry. Yeah, absolutely, and way more than that. <laughs> yeah, is that right? so? What do you teach these people like, from a value proposition? Like when you're offering value to a business like that, is it the same as any business when it comes to look? If you're going to do a social media campaign, doesn't matter if you're, you know, Switzerland tourism, Australian tourism, or whether you're a cafe down the road. Are the fundamentals? Very much the same in your opinion? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I definitely specialize in the travel space. Yep. Um, photography to Is a lesser extent. Is that because of the extent. passion? It's because of the passion. But right. I think that the principles... If you had a passion in donuts, you might specialize in social media for Definitely. Yeah, donut people. <laughs> but I think the principles of social media do apply across okay. multiple businesses and brands. But for me, you know, I'm I'm quite small in what I do. It's very niche. Um, I'm mainly about Instagram and I'm mainly about travel, travel and photography. Yeah, and right. I've just, you know, I, I did get good advice. Um, in the early days and it was risky advice um, but I was talking to uh, who was then the head of social media for Tourism Australia Uh, his name's Jesse Desjardins and he said to me be the Instagram girl and I wrote it down I I think I still have it on a scrap of paper somewhere and that's risky because if Instagram crashed and burned um, back then that would just be my thing gone and I have since diversified but for the first year or even two years, that was my thing. I was the Instagram girl. I ran Instagram campaigns. I did Instagram trips. I posted almost solely on Instagram. And that was the start of it all. And I've diversified, you know, obviously for, yeah. for security um, since then. But like I said, everything that I've branched off into has been very intuitive and has sort of led me down that track of will this create a life of photography and travel and, yeah, right. and social for me. So do you find intuition now has kind of taken a bit of a front seat in not just your business life, but in many areas of your life in general now? Like are you someone that's quite driven by what feels right? Absolutely. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a massive turnaround for me. I'm very, um, very led by my gut now. Yeah. And what's been the transformation in your life? Like, do you experience a greater level of fulfillment? And I don't want to prime the question, but, yeah. but clearly I'm going to assume, you know, your life now living based on what feels right and gut instinct is going to be very different to what you thought you had to do in the past when, you know, in order to make bank. Well... It's, it's scary when you're starting to make money and when your business is starting to cost more money to run. Mm. Uh, you're always thinking about, have I got enough money coming in? I think all creative people and all freelancers have that. Uh, this year in particular has been a massive change year for me. Uh, I've been doing it for five years and I always had this goal in my mind, like the first five years you work the hardest. Mm. So I've, I've really put my head down and worked for five years. And it was at the expense of, you know, my relationship really struggled. Uh, my health struggled. I put on a lot of weight. Uh, I stopped seeing all of my friends, less time for my family. And I knew that after that five year period, it was time to start getting those things back. Mm. So this year for me, is about, you know, I've, I've saved a stack of money. I've made some investments. I've got an online course coming out, for example. So I've got other sources of income coming up. And this year, I just want to travel more for passion, uh, take jobs that speak to my heart. Uh, for example, I went to Borneo and worked with the orangutans this year. Oh, wow. Didn't get paid, obviously, donated yep. my time. Uh, finally, getting my health back on track. Good for you. I've lost 10 kilos in the last you six or seven weeks. little ripper. <laughs> um, and one of the things I actually read an article of yours uh, that talked about intermittent fasting. Yes. That's one of 
the things I've implemented. And wow. it's, it's amazing. It's Isn't really it fantastic? helping. Yep. So How long I'm getting have you been my on health. It? Uh, about yeah, about six or seven weeks, I think. Okay, Not fantastic. that long. But um, That's enough to get you, – you're probably in the fat adapted zone right now. Have you stopped, stopped getting the cravings in the morning? Oh, absolutely. Cravings yeah. are gone. I've, yeah. I've never been hungry in the morning okay, and that's why perfect. I thought that was a really yeah. good, easy – because I need something that works when I travel as well. And have you found the weight just naturally comes off you now as a yeah. result? It's beautiful, and isn't it's, it? And it's so, giving me more energy yeah. and I'm eating better foods because you don't want to, you know, waste the effort and I'm exercising. I've started doing crazy hikes this year. Good for I just you. did this 18K hike in Patagonia that was nuts. In Patagonia? In Patagonia, Patagonia Chile. is stunning. <laughs> You know, it's so funny. I was actually, because I wear Patagonia gear. Nice. I, no, I have their vest. I literally just have four vests <laughs> from Patagonia. That's it. But then I was uh, I was in Byron Bay and uh, a guy stopped me on the street and he goes, uh, I think he was Chilean or something. Is that where Patagonia is? Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay, good. And oh, Argentina. The, Argentina, whatever. <laughs> um, me and geography, not best of friends. And he, and he, uh, he stopped. Actually, no, it was in fucking Woolworths. He was he was a Chilean behind, <laughs> behind <laughs> scanning my shit. And he goes to me, he says, have you, uh, so have you ever been to Patagonia? I was like, no. He goes, as soon as you go home, you must Google Patagonia. As soon as you go home, you Google Patagonia and you look at the mountains. Timmy, Google Patagonia. And um, so anyway, I didn't wait until I got home. I literally got out of Woolworths in Byron. I Google Patagonia and the mountain ranges are stunning. Is that what you hiked? Yeah. So I hiked um, this massive range called, uh, well, I hiked to the towers. It's called La Tours. Yep. At, um, of course it is. Uh, Oh, I forget the name. Del Paine, something Del Paine. Torres sure. Del Paine. Okay. Torres Del Paine in Chile. Okay. And there's these towers that are always covered in cloud and it's almost impossible to see them. It's a 9K uphill hike, even to get wow. a crack at seeing them. And we did a 3.30 wake up, started hiking, like hit the trails at 4 a.m. Yeah. And hiked four and a half, five hours in the dark to get to the top. Good for you. So, um, so yeah, big changes there. And, That's awesome. um, and the relationship, which has been great for the last three years, I did manage to recapture that quite early. Yeah. Um, but we're just about to go to Europe for a one month holiday. Congratulations. So really prioritizing my partner, yep. my family. I'm taking my mum to Namibia this year. Wow. Uh, trips that don't necessarily pay, but that I, you know, that I really want to do. Yeah. Just, just big changes. And, and I believe that things will settle where they settle yep. and things will happen as they're supposed to. Yeah, that's a beautiful belief. So let's talk some fundamentals for, for perhaps some of the people who are listening because you you really are the Instagrammer, okay? So that's what you're known for. And we'll talk a bit of broader broader brush social, but I, I want to talk about Instagram because like right now, in my opinion, Instagram is really hot. It's up and coming. It has been for a long time, yep. but it really is still taking a very strong center stage, you know, still one of the uh, – per post, one of the highest engagements of any social network. Mm-hmm. Um, what are the fundamentals of Instagram that you've learned? Now, by the way, people should – no, like you're not just someone who's got, you know, 200,000 or 40,000 or you've got 459,000. Uh, there'll be probably 460,000 after this, I hope. 460,000 people on Instagram. What are the fundamentals that you've learned about Instagram? Because it has evolved, hasn't it, as oh, a platform? Look, it's changed a lot. Mm. Um, it's changed a lot because there's a lot more people using it. Mm. They've obviously had to start making money. Uh, Facebook is the owners of Instagram and the algorithms have changed significantly since the platform started. But at the end of the day, Instagram comes down to posting content that people want to look at. Let's before we dive into the fundamentals, just something you made me think of. In what what are the, some of the biggest changes that you've seen come through on Instagram? I mean, in terms of this used to work, but now now, now not so much. Ah, oh, well, the biggest change that I think was a bad idea was the change of the chronological news feed through mm. to the algorithmic news feed. Um, that's been something that all you know, heavy Instagram users, as I'd call myself, um, haven't liked yep. uh, a lot of celebrities. I don't think anybody likes it uh, except Instagram um, <laughs> because, <laughs> because it helps, uh, you know, it helps the bottom line. It helps them with friendly. their advertising. And, yep. um, but no, I think, you know, it's it's different because there is so, so many more people on mm. there. Uh, it's different because people are making money off it. And as soon as people start to make money, people want in. Uh, there's a lot of people that do the wrong thing on Instagram. You know, they're buying their followers or they're using automation or bots or software to make their account active so that they gain more followers. Which it's is a, a very, big no-no, right? Let's just hit that oh, one straight up. Because yeah. when I you're mean, buying followers, you're not buying engagement, you're buying vanity. But people can buy engagement as well. You know, anything's for sale with Instagram now. And that leaves a really nasty taste in my mouth mm. um, as an account that's organically grown 
a hundred percent, you know, from day one, every person that's followed me has come across me naturally. And I really believe in that because I believe that influence is just trust. You know, it's like having a trusted friend and you can't buy that, you know, you have to earn it. So for me, nearly eight years on the platform, relationships that have grown over that period, people that I've met in real life, people I've, you know, talked to people whose houses I've stayed with, who have driven me around Banff, you know, you can't buy that and you can't hurry it up and you can't cheat it. I think that's an important thing to really point. You can't buy a good relationship. No. It's something that develops over time. Absolutely. Through the exchange of value. Yes. That meets people's values. So let's get back to the fundamentals. So the fundamentals of being a good Instagrammer, coming from Australia's professional Instagrammer, first (laughs) professional Instagrammer, what are they? Good content. Good content. Number one. And what does that look, I I guess that kind of speaks for itself. What what does that look like on Instagram? Because Look, it really depends on the account. Yep. You know, if, if you're a food account, you would want to give pictures of great looking food that people love to look at and they say yummy. Um, and then maybe a recipe or a diet tip. You know, it's, it's all about giving people value. And that might be in the way of the image or the video, or it might be in the caption, or it might be in your Instagram story. But whatever it is, if you want to entice people to, to follow you and be a part of your journey, you have to give them something. And a lot of brands get that wrong. You know, they think it's just about marketing. It's like every other marketing channel. Let's just put our messaging out there, cram it down people's throats. Why aren't we getting any followers? Let's mm. buy some. You know, it's 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 not that platform. It's a platform about making connections and, and people wanting to follow you. And nobody will want to follow you unless your content's really great and it's exciting them and making them happy. So when I run workshops, one of the first slides I bring up is just like literally a screenshot of three different accounts that I follow that are amazing. And I tell people to ask themselves, would you follow your account? Because, you know, they probably wouldn't. It's probably boring, filled with ads, nothing of value there that people would be interested by. But there's these other accounts, like for me, the three accounts are the feed feed. The feed feed. Because I love food. Okay. Uh, the pictures are beautiful and there's often recipes. Yeah. Uh, one is Sam. Uh, he plays Jamie on Outlander. I can't think of his last name. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll, I'll pull it up. Um, but he's like gorgeous and he posts heaps of pictures of himself. So yeah. that's a little guilty pleasure. Why um, not? And the third one is Menswear Dog. And men's if you don't follow that dog. account, you're missing out. Is that men? Okay. Menswear. It's a dog wearing menswear clothing. Hint. Oh, I swear to God. <laughs> you- Sam Hugan. Sam Hugan, that's the one. You're on. <laughs> Who to cares it. what his name is? <laughs> his name's he looks Jamie delicious. on Outlander. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so really, like the thing that I want to teach my clients when yeah. I'm doing these workshops is like, why would people follow you? What are you giving them that makes them want to look at your content, yeah, want right. to engage with it? Because I think a lot of people get kind of wound up in, well, well, if I'm in food or if I'm, you know, in fashion, like, I, I, let's just look at a basic one because we can apply this to anything. Do I just? How do I just? How do I not get to the point where I'm just doing the same thing every time? Time. Like how do you differentiate your content on Instagram in a way where you're not pushing out the same content all the time because you perhaps you're in an, in something that is quite mm. vertical? Well, it has to be quite intuitive really. You know, you really need someone on your social if it's not you yourself yeah. that just kind of gets it and has a way of mixing it up. And, a, you know, a common mistake I see a lot of clients doing, so say it's a hotel, yeah. they think that the content just has to be their hotel mm. and that's it. Hotel, 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 hotel. So instead I (laughs) teach them be about the destination, be about the nearby Mm. restaurants, you know, be about what's going on in the area, be about any, any inspiring or motivating travel content that you can think of. Bring that message back. Because this is, that's because, and I think what's really smart about that is when you're being about things other than just you, you're involving and enrolling other people as well. Yeah. Um, which I guess kind of emph- opens the doorway to partnerships. Absolutely. But also I guess it opens the doorway to ask a question, well, when I'm perhaps, you know, in- involving other people around me, when I'm tagging them or I'm tagging other destinations, does that actually have an impact on my reach and my engagement? I think it's a good thing. Yeah. And I think that especially in tourism, and like I said, it's, it's quite niche what I do. So yep. I do know a lot about how the tourism industry works in Australia, but it starts with operators. And if you have great operators who are obviously experiencing their product every day, uh, doesn't matter what, it could be a restaurant or it could be, you know, a tour company or a four wheel drive company, they're out there living it and breathing it every day. So they're able to get great content and they're able to get the moments that people won't normally catch. Like when 
a koala breaks into the kindergarten or, you know, these these special moments that you or see drop, going viral. We call them drop bears drop here in Australia. Bears. They're very vicious, very violent. <laughs> but, you know, this, this really cool, unique content that the operators can get. And then if they're tagging in the regional tourism board, state tourism board and even Tourism Australia, these other, you know, the regional RTO, STO and Tourism Australia, they're able to re- reshare it, repurpose it. And all of a sudden this message is spreading really far. And as soon as TA, Tourism Australia, sorry, picks anything up, it does have viral potential because there's so many different platforms and channels that look at what TA is doing. So there's good examples of operators uh, like Symbio Zoo. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, this gorgeous little koala called Imogen. Uh, there's Ooh. been heaps of viral content of Imogen in the past. Uh, There's another one called the Kangaroo Sanctuary in Alice Springs uh, and they rescue little orphaned kangaroos, little joeys. Their content goes viral all the time and it's often reshared. So there's this whole structure behind it all and it, yeah, it does start at the ground up. When you say reshare, are you talking about regramming? (laughs) Regramming. Which is not something that's native to the platform. No, it's not. Not yet. Okay. So how would you instruct someone to regram when it's not native to the platform? What's, What's a little insider tip and hack you can give people. <laughs> well, there is a couple of apps for it, yep. but the the standard way is still to take a screenshot. Yeah, right. Yeah, believe it or not. How old school? I know. Well, <laughs> I know most of the state tourism boards that yep. I know do use apps, yep. um, apps where you can just type in like the URL of the post yep. and then they download it and it's slightly higher resolution. Um, I don't know the name of those apps okay. because, yeah, I just So when it comes screenshot. to the visual content, how important is it for the content to be, you know, sharp, crisp, clear? Like does the quality of the image, is it just the context, the content of the image or does the quality of the image, you know, have a lot of push behind the reach and the engagement as well? Well, look, it really depends on the account. Uh, If it's a photography account like mine, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Like the quality of the image is everything. You know, that's what people are looking for when they follow an account like mine. Uh, If it's, you know, if it's a funny account, uh, for example, I don't know if you follow Celeste Barber, you've no doubt heard of her. She's an Australian comedian and she recreates images of supermodels and actors and actresses. She's amazing. Like it's hilarious. So Celeste Barber, you know, I'm pretty sure her pictures are just taken on an iPhone. Celeste Barber. Celeste I'm, I'm, I'm going to check her out right now, actually. So people people don't look at Celeste Barber's account thinking I want a really sharp, like great landscape image. They look at her account to see who she's mocking today. Yeah, right. <laughs> and for that reason, like the quality and the sharpness and the resolution of yes, her sir? images, uh, that is the hashtag. If you go to the at username, oh. you'll find her account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can tell I've done this before. That's <laughs> Yeah, that's just, a, just a low 3.7 mil. <laughs> wow. Australian comedian, love that. So just um, just click on one of her pictures and you'll see it's it's obviously not taken with a <laughs> high end SLR camera. It's probably taken with an iPhone, but yeah, it's great. Right. You know, people go to her for that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love it. Oh, Celeste. Okay, okay. Filters. Should we be using filters? If you think it makes your image look better, yep. yeah, by all means. Okay. And do filters, do you think, have an impact when it comes to engagement, reach? I I do believe that there's a small part of the algorithm that favours filtered images. Okay. Yeah, Instagram overall, from what we know, it's like this mythical beast. Yeah, it's like all social media platforms. From what we know, um, Instagram likes you to use their features. Yeah, right. So the good thing about filters is you can take the strength of the filter down. Um, just press on it twice and then use the slider bar. So okay. I actually like the filters, but I don't like them at 100%. Okay. So I do use them, but I, I knock the strength off. Okay. And when it comes to hashtags, are you a big, big fan of hashtags? Yeah, my personal belief is that Instagram is phasing out hashtags. You think it's going to go completely? I do. Because we've this noticed space. a huge, you know, the, the huge transition. Because I remember the early days when I got on Instagram, I used to be able to pump, you know, uh, a block of 30 hashtags in the yeah. comments, leave it there for a couple, you know, 45 minutes, it get heaps of engagement, go back, delete it, you know, pump in another 30 yep. and it would, you'd get, you know, engagement for days. Yeah. Whereas now what we've observed is, you know, four or five hashtags. Absolutely. Not even in the comments anymore. Keep them in the captions. Yep. Do you think that Instagram is wanting to keep the comments free of hashtags from the publishers so that the, the followers, the community can start being involved in the, in the, in the, in the, the tagging of content? Look, I'm not sure why they're doing it, yep. um, but I do know they're doing a lot at the moment to clean up spam. And hashtags are one way that spammers can spread their content. Yeah, right. So 
Yeah, I mean, nobody really knows. It's all speculation. But I, like you, have noticed that less hashtags mm. and putting them in the caption is working better. If you do the big blocks of 30, I think Instagram registers it as spam, spam and you get this um, shadow banning or you know this buzzword that they've called it, but your pictures aren't appearing in those hashtags. So I'm not sure. I, I do think that they're working on like image recognition like Facebook where mm. they can, you know, the system can read what's in the image. And so you think they'll get to a point where there's no hashtag whatsoever? I do. Wow. I do. I'm not, That's a big I'm call. I'm not 100% sure, but, yeah. but I have a feeling, you know, there's been a lot of changes. There's been a lot of hints. Because do you use hashtags on Facebook? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Because we found typically two more than two hashtags it doesn't work very well. Yeah. But I was, I, but I've always wondered why you know Instagram doesn't follow the same suit, and, I'm, and I've always wondered if they're moving towards that two hashtag kind of we'll uh, have to have where this. There's, there's context and content. You know, hashtag for the content. You know, dog training yeah. context dogs. You know, as an example. But if they have really smart image recognition mm. software, they'll be able to see that there's dogs in the image without. The hashtag dog being but on that will image. will they see Britney Spears standing behind them? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Britney. All right. Hashtag. So, um, but as of right now, you're still using hashtags? Yes, I am. Okay. Less than eight in the caption. Less than eight in the captions. What about mi the content mix? You know, we're, we're hearing about how video is taking over everything. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of professional ac accounts getting more and more uh, density of video content in there. Uh, obviously, with your photographic background, you may not – are you playing with video very much? I'm starting to okay. because a lot of clients are asking me about it. Right. Right. Yeah, it's um, it's been interesting. This year is the first year it's affected me. In the past, I've found that, you know, they want video, they'll hire someone that does video. Uh, they want photography, they'll hire me or someone like me. Uh, but this year, you really are seeing clients that want everything. And I'm getting more and more requests. So I'm dabbling, okay. uh, upskilling, as it were. Um, I don't love it. You know, was it on my original list of three things that I love? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I certainly don't like editing it. Yeah. But I have, um, you know, I've got an editor that I work with. And I made my first video in Zimbabwe this year where I shot all the raw footage and it was edited together by my editor, Eleanor. Okay. Um, and it looks pretty good. So I, I'm confident enough to say to my clients, you know, if you really, really, really need me to do a video, yeah. you know, I can't guarantee it will be a masterpiece. Yeah. Um, but if that's the clincher for me to get this job, I'll have a go at it. But you are seeing a movement towards more video on Instagram? Uh, yes and no. Okay, this in is the space that I'm in, right. I still, you know, I still really prefer stills. I don't think I've ever posted a video on my account. Okay. Uh, I have heard from other is people this I know. But are, you, are you voicing publisher preference or are you seeing this from a user base as well, like at Broad? Well, I, I don't have enough to test, you know, I okay. haven't done enough video to really say, oh, my, but you're you know, on my Instagram audience really likes like, this. I don't seeing? see that much. I follow mainly photographers. Yeah, right. Okay. And the tourism boards that I follow and, you know, work with and talk to regularly, I know yep. that they are starting to use more video. Um, but a lot of them are using video in their stories. So stories mm. are obviously a whole nother kettle of fish, um, something I've been playing around with a lot more. Um, and I think that using video in stories and, and writing really good stories and having great content in that area is a massive value add as well. Because what I'm hearing also now from people is they're seeing high levels of engagement with stories yep. on their main feed. Yeah. And I'm actually seeing a lot of uh, influencers now even promoting new posts in their stories. Yeah. <laughs> this is you're seeing the same thing, obviously. Yeah. yeah. I, so when stories were first released, yeah. I wasn't really a fan. Um, I actually hadn't gone down the Snapchat road because you just you know, didn't like sending photos of your genitals to people. Yeah, that's all right. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I also, you know, I I like to enjoy what I'm doing. I don't yeah. like to be creating content and thinking about content a hundred percent of the time. Yeah, right. You know, I promote travel, and travel is what most people aspire to do, you know, people work to travel. So I don't want to like every spare second be taking photo and video with my phone and mm. have this whole, you know, I just wanted to have some time to enjoy. And also I'm not, you know, I don't like to put myself on camera that much. Uh, but, you know, when stories first came out, I started using it. I saw the the reach and the impressions. It was amazing, undeniably valuable for my clients. Um, but my stories, I didn't wrap my mind around it. So my stories weren't that good. You know, it was like, this is what I'm eating and here I am and oh, forgot to post anything and randomly here's the sunrise. And it was, you know, it was just shit content. So probably in the last year, I've started really thinking about my stories and using it to tell stories. So I pre-plan them, you know, what did I do I yesterday? This. I had this hilarious bike ride in the mountains and my friend fell off her bike and it was really funny. So then I'll start to, I'll choose all the images that I want to use 
to tell this story and videos. I'll, right. um, I'll go through so it all. So you're doing post-production for your stories? Pretty much. So, so I'll go live, in and live, I'll yeah, – it's, yeah. it's fairly live. Yep. It's still – and, you know, I don't lie. It's not like this is right now. No, no, no. It's, yeah, um, I get it. Yesterday was the funniest day ever, dot, dot, dot. So people want to flick through and, Got it. and then it will be, you know – Dun dun, we went on this bike ride and, you know, I, I just take the time to make it interesting and look beautiful and have have a flow so that from slide one through to whatever, you know, it could be 15, even up to 30 yeah, slides, right. it has this cohesive storytelling oh, element to it. I love that. And, you know, the first person who I actually saw do that well was, and this is going to sound really bad, it was actually on Snapchat, but it was... Um, uh, I think it was not Kendall, not Kendall Jenner. What's the other girl? Kylie Jenner. Ooh. And they were doing these mini, these mini Snapchat movies okay. that were like 30, 40 frames, yep. 30, 40 snaps, but it was telling this whole story. And I swear when I was looking at them, I was like, these guys clearly paid someone to come in and, you know, write the content, storyboard it, and then they just acted it out. But it was like the first time I looked at someone's stories and I was like, wow, that's actually really impressive. That's you awesome. can really do something cool yeah. with that. And so when you say writing a story, you, yeah. you're literally talking about, you know, actually put some thought into it, yep. sit down and put some production value into what it is that you're doing. Absolutely. And honestly, like the engagement that I get on my stories now is amazing. Took a little while to, you know, get people back yeah. after the, those <laughs> after boring, the- terrible stories <laughs> uh, to see that I was doing something valuable now. But I regularly get, you know, 60 replies, DMs plus of people saying, you know, I love your story so much and post more stories and this is my favourite thing. Beautiful. And, you know, I get really good engagement on them and higher than my posts. Well, it, yeah, interesting yeah. you should say that. A lot of people saying the same, but uh, like the stats are one in five stories from a business actually generates a direct response from a user. Yeah, wow. Which is a, the reason that we Powerful. do what it is that we do, right, mm-hmm. is to engage with that audience and actually get a dialogue going that, that can ultimately lead to a relationship being built yeah. and ultimately even a transaction being made. And, the you know, the good thing about stories is you can be, for me as a photographer, you know, I have this standard of content that I put on my main account and I don't have to worry about that with my story Mm. as far as the image goes, you know, it's still good content, but it, I can take it with my iPhone and it doesn't have to be, you know, all just great images. It's more about, I can put myself on there, you know, put my ugly mug on there and, you know, just beautiful. Don't be like that. You are a gorgeous woman. You You uh, should see, you should see my hiking selfies. You might say differently. Okay. Let's, let's whip them out. (laughs) All right. Let's talk, um, posting frequency main feed. Um, you know, I hear all sorts of, you know, all, all sorts of things from all sorts of people with the changes in the algorithms and the, and the, and the way the feed is being, uh, content's been distributed in the feed. What is the optimal number of times for someone to be publishing per day on Instagram? Uh, less is more at the moment. Okay. Uh, so definitely no more than one a day. Really? And even one a day is a lot at the moment. Really? But if you're, it's different depending on the size of your account. Okay. If you're still attracting a new audience yep. and if you're engaging a lot when you post, yep. if you're online for that period, you can do more. Okay. That's sort of like a growth period. For me, because of how the algorithms work and because I have an older account, uh, if I post more than once a day, I'll get half the engagement on each post. Really? And it's it's funny because back in the early days of Instagram, basically the shelf life of an image was about three hours. Yes. And now it's about 24 to 36 hours. Yeah. So back then, you know, I posted four or five times a day. And that was awesome. Every time I posted, I, it was going gangbusters. It was yeah. on the popular page, as it was then called. Yeah. Uh, I would get followers off every single post that I did. You know, they all consistently performed. If I did like four or five posts right now today, I reckon they'd get a thousand likes each. Yeah, right. Yeah, that really, it would be a fraction of what they usually get. What an incredible insight. So big change. Yeah. Big change. What about the grid? Um, you know, the grid is something I think a lot of people ignore. I'm one of them. You know, I'm old adapter. Grid life. Grid life, right. <laughs> and the grid is essentially, for those people who don't know, it's when you hit the, 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 the squares button on the far left corner when you're looking at your feed, it shows the three photos across, three photos under. How important is it to be managing your grid? From what I've heard, it's less important than it used to be, yep. but I still think it's really important. Um, if you think of, you know, on social media, on Instagram, what you're trying to do is entice people to follow you and they're finding you via hashtags. You know, we're talking about all these ways. Why would people follow you? You use hashtags, you use geotags, uh, you post great content that's valuable and cool stories, but no matter how people find you, the first place they go is to your profile mm. and that's when they decide whether they'll follow you or not. So if your profile looks bad, you know, if the grid is not on point <laughs> and um, 
you know, if it's just not looking interesting or enticing, people will make that snap judgment not to follow you. But if it's, if it's looking great, uh, if they can see straight away what they're getting themselves into, like for me, it's obviously travel and photography with Celeste Barber. It's obviously, you know, her celebrity takeoffs, you know, if it's the feed feed, it's obviously beautiful plates of food and flat lays, but people like to have a good overall look at the account and then make that decision whether to follow or not. So I do think the grid is still important. Okay. I still think that's where people make their mind up. Do you at all, when it comes to keeping your grid clean and keeping your feed clean, keeping your grid clean and your content clean, uh, if you have an underperforming post, do you leave it there or are you someone that, okay, I'm going to clean up my grid in archive posts just to keep my grid clean if, if something's not performing well? No. So I actually visually, I pre-plan how my grid looks. Okay. I never put a post up unless I've sort of plotted it out in my little my little album. I've called it Instagram layout. I can show you how it's done. It's, yeah, right. it's a little OCD. I love it. So I always know when I put a photo up that visually it will work. Yeah. Uh, as far as performance and, you know, engagement on the post. No, I leave everything up there. You know, every post on my feed tells a story, mm. even non-work related ones. And even my very, very early iPhone photography, it's all still there. So people, and actually it's funny because I have five and a half thousand posts on my account now. And probably once a year, I'll I'll go, I'll scroll all the way back to the very, very first post. And there's usually two or three people that have said something along the lines of, you know, I've just scrolled all the way back and wow, what a journey you've had. Oh. And I follow those people. Yeah, right. Because they deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> that's an effort. Yeah. Yeah. And okay, I guess that's another question. Follow for follow is clearly the biggest false economy that's ever lived mm-hmm. when people are like, I'll follow you if you follow me. But what I am curious to know is, do the amount of people that you follow have an impact on your account in terms of the amount of visibility that gets based on what algorithm, or based on what the algorithm sees? Look, that's one I don't know the answer to. Okay. I've never really considered it. Uh, social media for me is an extension of who I am in real life yeah. as a person. A lot of people don't treat it that way. It's this whole separate entity, like this is my Instagram. But for me, if I follow someone, you know, if I follow you, how would you feel if in a week's time, you know, you're, you're editing or, you know, you're editing the content and you find out that I unfollowed you, like I've just followed you for that one moment in time. Awkward. It's mean. Is that mean? It's mean. Oh, I feel like such a bastard now. How many people have you unfollowed? Well, see, I, I try <laughs> to keep my numbers low because I'm, I don't want to make the same mistake I made with Facebook. Mm. And the mistake I made with Facebook is I literally, you know, in the early days, I accepted almost every friend as long as they had a photo in their profile pic, right? Hit the limit. And now I literally spend at least 20 to 30% of my time going unfollow this person because if they made it easier to unfriend them, I don't unfriend them because I'm, I'm looking at people, I don't even know who the fuck you are. <laughs> and so I said, I'm never going to make that mistake again. And so along comes Instagram. And so this is going to help qualify because there are some people who probably right now going thinking came in is a He's a bitch. He's a bitch. He unfollowed me. But it's not because I'm a meanie. It's because I literally go, okay, I only want the content in my feed that I want. I'll follow certain people. But if you're just putting up stuff that I'm not interested in, it's not that I don't like you. I'm just yeah. not going to follow you. I mean, it's it's personal preference. Yeah. And that's the beauty of Instagram. We I just had to say that because I know that. <laughs> you're covering your ass. You're covering your ass. I'm covering my ass. <laughs> but, you know, for me, I don't like to make people feel bad in that way. Yeah. How and many people I, do you follow? Uh, only two and a half thousand. Yeah, right. Which is a pretty low number when you consider how many people I've met, you know, in my line of work. Yeah, no kidding. So yeah. I, I generally follow people that I've I've met in real life, you know, people that I go to Insta meets with. I try to follow all of them. A lot of people that come to my conference. Oh, God, like friends and family. Yes, their content's shit. Like it's terrible. Okay. But right. they're my friends, you know. I'm not going right. to unfollow them. All right. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. Uh, clients. Yes. You know, not just the tourism boards, right. but the actual clients, you know, the people that are hosting me that okay. I'm spending a week with. Okay. So, yeah, it's crept up there over the years. And my feed, you know, my home feed doesn't look like a photographer's home feed. It's not always beautiful, but the people on there are beautiful. Oh. And I like to see what they're doing. Oh. <laughs> all right. For fuck's sake. I'll go and refollow everyone I unfollow. That'll be watching now you won't <laughs> so influencer marketing does that play much of a, a role in um, your strategies these days yeah that's still a big part of what i do yep. is i work with brands and tourism boards uh in that space so for people who don't know what influencer marketing is just give us like the the, the 20 second snapshot of what influencer marketing is for people who have been hiding under a rock uh, well the definition i give people is that 
it's not quite marketing, but it's more than PR. Uh, so marketing is when you're directly trying to sell something and, yep. and convert. Uh, PR is just the spread of information. So letting people know about something. So it's kind of somewhere in the middle of that. Uh, I'm letting people know about something, generally a destination. That's my preferred work. Um, but it's a little bit more because I'm then having conversations with people. If they're asking questions, you know, I can, I can give them answers to anything they want to know about that destination. And I'm enticing them further to want to convert but not to the point of here's an Instagram post. Now book a holiday to France yeah, because right. I don't think that, especially with Instagram as a platform, I don't think that it is a platform to convert travel straight away. But I think with any marketing, um, as you I'm sure are very well aware, uh, it's all about touch points. Exactly. And I think social media is a massive piece of that puzzle. And I think that's where most people screw up, uh, not just influencer marketing, but just marketing or social in general. They're looking for the, well, if this person does a post for me and I'm not getting sales coming in, yeah. it's not working. So no do. You know, it's that understanding that we need at least 20 solid touch points before someone even Absolutely. considers in most cases, you know, reaching out to us. Uh, and for those people who are listening to this, like uh, like influencer marketing is a huge opportunity. And, and if you're searching for influencers either by uh, geotag or hashtag, you can find people in your area that, that perhaps are interested in the stuff that you do that have huge followings that if you were to perhaps build a relationship with them, they might actually start posting and tagging your business in the content that they're publishing out there. Absolutely. And, you know, influence, it's very nuanced. It's very hard to define. There's no, there's no one way of deciding this person is influential to this level and can do this. You know, it's, it's about trust. It's about relationships. So when you're working with any influencer, you want to know that they have the trust of their audience and that their audience is quite large. You know, those are ultimately what you're looking for. Mm. So how do people find influencers for their market? You have to be active on the platform. Yeah. You know, if you, if but you can want you to just work, go to the platform and just search under hashtags and, and, and find influences that way. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the top posts feature, uh, yeah. which is a feature of most uh, of actually all hashtags and geotags. It's like the top nine posts and maybe it's more now. Okay. So let's say you found some um, influences that have blue ticks. Bastards. Not necessarily. They don't necessarily have to have blue mm-hmm. ticks. Okay. We should say that. I was just trying to be humorous. <laughs> uh, how do we connect with influences in order to perhaps, you know, engage in a discussion about some form of a campaign? Well, look, most influencers are kind of jerks. A lot of people get an audience on social media and it goes to their head. Yeah. You know, they just stop humaning, you know, they stop being just humaning. nice, decent yeah. humans. I hate it when people stop humaning. Yeah, I know, yeah. right? Humaning. humaning. So um, it can be hard. Okay. Uh, the first thing I would say is DM them. Yeah. Although email is always best. Really? Um, I oh, find absolutely. DMs like, it's like almost to the heart of the beast in many cases. No, for me, I, I actually hate getting stuff through DM. Yeah. Because right. if, I, if I open it, if I'm busy, you know, I'm about to fly, I'm just checking my DMs and then there's a massive like proposal slash idea okay. in my DMs. Well, that's the first fuck up. You don't, yeah. you don't put a proposal in your DM, you put the opener. Some brands do. Oh, geez. But my, my email address is in my profile. You know, if you oh. have a business proposition. Yeah. Just well, that's email smart, me. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the best way. Uh, as well, if I don't follow an account, yeah. that DM will go into my others folder, which is checked less mm. regularly. Some people don't check it at all. You know, really big accounts. <laughs> people, uh, people that are getting a lot of DMs and they yeah. don't know that this function exists. Okay. Yeah, there's there's going to be a lot of stuff in there you've missed. And some people are getting completely screwed over and others are being completely taken advantage of yeah. when it comes to valuing an influencer and what how you pay and how you value a post or a mention or a tag. It, what's the, is there a formula or how do you kind of create some reality and grounding in, 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 in a frame? Like we literally had a person recently – we we're like, oh, we'll bring you in on the podcast, and you know, if you can just give us a uh, like a shout out, and they're like, oh, 12 grand, and we're like, <laughs> I almost gagged, but I was like, okay, and this person wasn't even a huge Instagrammer, and yeah. I was just like, what, where, where'd you get that number from? Like, does it literally you just pluck it out? Look, how, how do you value this stuff? Look, it goes both ways. Uh, brands take <laughs> yeah. advantage of in- influencers, and right. influencers take advantage of brands. Yep. Uh, I was the first person in Australia, I believe, and it's never been contested uh, to monetize my Instagram account. Yeah, right. In travel, you know, travels. A very different space to, for example, fashion. Um, but in the travel space, I have been very, very over what people have been paying and what people have been earning for many years. Okay. You know, it's it's definitely grown way beyond me now in the last couple of years. It's it's massive. I wouldn't know what people are, are charging and getting. Um, but I think it's all about 
equal value and if you if you fair exchange you know you I was invited to come on your podcast I had a bit of a google and a research of what you do and your audiences and it seemed like an amazing value for me to do it so I'm of course very happy to promote this podcast it's good for me and it's good for you and I would never charge for that that's equal value (laughs) in kind value you know but if it comes to working for a tourism board tourism boards only have a limited budget so generally as an influencer, you would be getting in the hundreds of dollars a day, not the thousands of dollars a day. Mm. That would be standard. But you also get the travel on top of that. And you can't underestimate what that travel's worth. If I wasn't traveling, I wouldn't have any content. So if, if for example, a really incredible destination can't turn you back on, you know, something that's going to get you great content and be a massive value add to your brand and your followers, you might do that for free. That might be a contra job. But most tourism jobs, you know, it's a lot of hard work. I'm charging six fifty a day is what I charge for that. But for a sponsored post, on the other hand, or if it's not a tourism board, if it's a bigger brand, bigger budgets, it's much different costing. And it could be up to $5,000 for a post on my feed, depending on what the messaging is. Like that. And in saying that, um, I do only work with clients and brands that I really respect, mm. you know, people that I use anyway. I've just started working with Bose quite recently. Uh, I'm so happy to promote them. I use them when I travel. I was buying them before the relationship. Yeah. Uh, I work with Olympus. Uh, I've just been signed up officially as an Olympus visionary. So I'm an ambassador for that brand. Congratulations. It's a big one. So I, I generally don't charge them anything. I'm always posting about Olympus because I want to shout it from the rooftop. So it's, it's very different what you charge. I think it's really important. You mentioned something in there, you know, you, you only align with the brand, something to the effect you only align with the brands that you love, that yeah. you already like. And I think that, that's important both ways. You know, influencers should only you know, align with the brands that they, uh, you know, are in love with or that they use and you know businesses should only ever align with the influences where there's a genuine alignment in, in values and, and connection um in, one other thing i want to ask you before we we get close to wrapping this up engagement groups have you heard of engagement groups i have okay so for those people who don't know what an engagement group is tell us a little bit about what it is and 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 what the merit in them is so with the algorithm changes with instagram it's it's very important to get a lot of engagement when you first post because that as tells soon as possible that tells Instagram that it's a good piece of content. Is it also inspo- uh, important to respond to that engagement as quickly as possible? Yeah, I yep. think that being active. Um, so basically people, again, have found a way to give themselves an unfair advantage. Yeah. I think it's going to be quite clear what my stance on this is. Yes. Uh, and they've, you know, they've gone out to a group of their friends or people that are in photography groups or Instagram pals or whatever it is, and they've basically said, let's form a pod. That's the official cool word for it. Uh, And that pod will agree to engage on each other's content as soon as it goes live. Um, I'm opposed to it. Uh, I'm really opposed to anything that gives an unfair advantage Mm. on this platform. I think it's, it's bettering your work or, or pushing your work up the algorithms at the expense of other people. And I don't like that. You know, I think that if everybody's playing fair and yeah. if it's just the content, you know, the merit of the content that's up there, that's, that's playing a part in the engagement, then we're all on the same playing field. Yeah. But everybody's always looking for a cheap shot. Yeah, you know, they, they all want to get ahead at the expense of others. And I, again, it's just, it's yuck to me. It just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Great insights. Biggest mistakes. What are the top three mistakes you see people making on Instagram? Oh, in general? Yeah. I mean, or influences. Look, like anyway, you can go anywhere you want. Where do you feel inspired to talk? Uh, I, I just don't like seeing really boring content that just there's no reason for it. You know, why is that there? That's a bit of a mistake for me. Mm. Um, especially, you know, I, I guess I will be talking about trying to get into the industry because uh, that's – something I'm so involved in, you know, if you want to be an influencer, if you want to grow your audience for any reason, really think about your content and make sure it's great. Uh, I think definitely using the captions. uh, I see people not utilizing that space. Because people read the captions. Absolutely. And we've actually seen huge differences in performance by just having a good solid caption. Yes. And, you know, a picture doesn't tell people anything about you or the moment Mm. or the story behind that picture. So for me, the caption is a a place for my followers to get to know me better. Mm. So I think it's, it's a very important, very valuable place to spend a little bit of time telling a story. Uh, And also I guess the third one would be not engaging at all. Mm. So a lot of people look at it as a platform to here's me, 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 you know, look at me, look at my content. It's all about me uh, rather than going out and supporting other people and being involved in the platform. Uh, Brands are very guilty of that, but a lot 
of influencers are as well. They don't take the time to go and look at what the people they follow, what they're doing and, and what they're and saying. engage and, and just be on top of what's going on with everyone. I remember reading this, uh, this stat, I think it was about 12 months ago, that 79% of brands on social media don't respond to messages. Like wow. in general. Yeah, I'd believe it. And, and it was I'd at that point, that. Yeah, like, and, and I remember thinking, geez, you only got to be a little bit better than shit, don't you? <laughs> like in order to really, because when we talk about social media, you know, it's almost like Think and Grow Rich. Have you read the book Think and Grow Rich? No. So it's written by Napoleon Hill. He'd be the 500 wealthiest people in that time. And I remember he said, uh, I was like 23, 24 when I read it for the first time. He goes, this book contains a secret. And the secret might even be contained in the title of this book. And I remember going to the title, reading the title, going, fuck, what is it? I can't, I still can't get it. What am I missing? But um, it's, it's almost true. You know, the same is almost true in social media. The secret to social media is in the term. Social. social media. Yes. You know, it's a media, but the more social you are, Absolutely. that is what actually drives, you know, the engagement. That's what drives relationships. And, you know, I see this mistake being made as well. Like, honestly, one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make on social media is they try to use it to make sales. Yeah. And definitely. I think that's where 99% of people fuck it up because yeah. they go, well, if it's not giving me positive ROI immediately, and it's not making sales immediately, then I'm out. I say, dude, you just don't understand this, this, this whole game. <laughs> yeah. The mere exposure effect is what drives the whole social environment, you know, with this, it's, which is the psychological phenomenon mm. whereby people tend to develop a preference for things because they become familiar with them, yep. which requires the levels, levels of exposure. And sometimes people need to see things 5, 10, 15, and based on the latest data, you know, 18 to 20 times yeah. before that familiarity is built. And that's where we've got to be focusing on that social aspect, that relationship. And if we focus on social, we focus on connection, we focus on engagement relationships, then, you know, sales will generally naturally happen as a result of that consequence. Yeah. And it's, it's been interesting for me, you know, I've obviously worked in influencer marketing for mm. five years, but two years ago, I started my own conference uh, with two business partners, but seeing how my social posts actually affect the ticket sales is really been interesting for me. And whenever I do a, you know, early bird special ends today post, mm, nothing. Yeah. But if I do anything emotionally driven, anything from the heart, and I don't even tell people to buy a ticket, I don't even mention the conference. That's when I get the sales. Yeah. And so many people have converted from my Instagram. It's, it's astounding to me because it's not a cheap product and our marketing is very bad because we're so busy. Um, and it's pretty funny that we actually use that to sell the conference. Like our marketing is shit because we're so <laughs> successful at what we're going to teach you. So uh, you should come. <laughs> and we teach people how to get paid to travel. Yeah. It's, um, it's a consumer facing. That's event. so cool. Yeah. You know, it's funny cause I, I share a very similar story on Facebook, like 99 percent of my content look i'll be honest with you we're still getting our head around instagram like we make great money we probably make 50 plus grand, grand a month off instagram which is great but facebook is where we we you know we slash we slay demons on, yeah. on on facebook but um one of the things that people find astounding is 99.999 percent of my content there's no call to action there's no yeah. sales pitch there's no link to a website it's just give 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 but the flip side of that is we get anywhere between 20 to 120 messages a day from people saying have you got something i can buy wow like literally and they get pissed when you say no they get pissed <laughs> yeah. when you say no and they're like but surely you must have to buy something to buy you're a, you're a business for god's sakes okay this i gotta say lauren this has been not only entertaining but this has been incredibly educational at the same time so how can people find out more about what you do because you run social media trainings instagram trainings you know you, you you've got some pro online courses coming out you, you people yeah. can follow you how can they find out Lots more about lauren stuff. bath uh, so i just did my website this year congratulations thank you it's pretty smick i have to oh, say it's nice you. and sexy I'm a grown up girl now. Yeah, you're all <laughs> I'm grown an up. Adult. I'm not just on Instagram. <laughs> so, um, so no, the website was a big one for me. Yeah. I, I really needed to get that up so that people know the full extent of what I can do. And it's just laurenbath.com. Uh, and another new thing I'm doing next year is trips to Zimbabwe, our photography tours. Yeah, so really? So that's, that's going to be really special. That will be incredibly yeah. special. Zimbabwe is a very special place. Yeah, it is. So I, um, I'm actually about to, I've got a few people have registered their interest and I'm about to just announce the dates and the price for that. So Oof. only six spots and hopefully I'll fill them up because it's, again, it's passion. Oh, you'll fill them up. There'll be yeah. no question about that. Have you ever thought about, like, because I know the tourism stuff with you, it's in the, probably the, the, in the lower range in terms of the budgets. Income, yeah. Yeah, like have you thought about targeting different ends of the markets by perhaps going into resort bodies and resort groups and hotel groups? Uh, look, I have worked with a few hotel chains yeah. and if anything, I find that their budget is smaller for influencers. No kidding. Idiots. It's for influence. People are coming around okay. and the industry grows stronger every year mm. and I've been very consistent throughout. I have a great reputation. I'm very personable. Very I reply honest. all of my emails. I'm yeah. very honest. I've got integrity. You know, I think that 
my career in that sense will go from strength to strength. I agree wholeheartedly. But it's, it's time sensitive. You know, I can only travel as much as there are days in the year. And that's why my conference, my consultancy and my online course that's coming, that sort of stuff's important to be happening in the background yep. uh, so that I can take time to, to travel with my partner and my, take my mum to Namibia and, that's beautiful. and do all that other stuff that, that I'm really passionate about as well. Lauren, it has been not only fun, but a lot of education at the same time. Thank you so much for coming Thank in. Thank you for having me, Kerwin. Real pleasure. <laughs> There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And do me a favor, don't forget to drop me a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear what you think. I love reading what you guys have to say. And your reviews make sure we keep creating killer content just like this. If you want to stay up to date with me and all my movements, please jump onto the website, kerwinray.com. And also check us out on social media, at Kerwin Ray. 